parcel food, which is essentially a meat delivery service. I love my birch bag. So I started using a flower delivery service called Bloom On. Uh, it's called Surfdo, and they sell surfing stuff, but I used it for winter sports things. Um, I'm using ASOS. I have a subscription to use my bread. Just eat. I'm currently using myprotein.com. It's a service called The Outnet, which uh, is an online outlet for designer designer clothes. I love my Netflix subscription. So I use uh, Netflix, Hulu, Spotify. It's cheaper than going in the shops, which is always benefit uh, it's high quality than kind of most supermarket um, supermarket kind of own brands and just the fact that you can buy in bulk so. the website is so nice to use it's really pretty and when you're going through the steps of picking small bars medium bars you know big it's all little infographics and drawings and it's just really visual and really nice and then I like it because I get next day delivery with it it has the saved items thing, so you can save. Thank you very much and welcome everyone. I'm uh, really actually genuinely thrilled to have such a good turnout um, of people here this afternoon, which I think is testimony to the hot topic of DTC. So um, thank you very much for coming. Uh, and also um, thanks for anyone who's tuning in to our live stream event. Um, so I'm Carlia, I'm a director at the Big Picture. I'm based at our New York office. And uh, I've uh, been working on a few of uh, the DTC projects that we've had uh, at the big picture. Uh, so this is a, a topic that's close to my heart and I can talk quite a lot about it so hopefully I get time to speak to some of you after the event. Um, so I'm also really thr uh, thrilled to have such uh, a wide array of great speakers um, sharing the stage with me today. So um, I'm going to be going through uh, talking a little bit about e um, each of our speakers and then they're going to come up and do a short sparky um, presentation uh, as well. And what's great about um, some of the, the startups that we're uh, going to be listening uh, to is that they really represent uh, companies like the Dollar Shave Club who have totally um, kind of uh, you know shaken up what it means to have this kind of relationship with consumers. They really represent almost the kind of ultimate end-to-end uh, -end, um, relationship, tapping into consumers' needs. Um, in a new and different way, and bypassing um, the kind of troublesome middleman, the retailer. Uh, so you know, no longer having to buy data from the retailer or acquiesce to when the retailer wants to put out a new line or have a new season, they can just kind of um, meet the demands of their consumer directly. Um, so uh, we have five speakers today. Um, we're going to start things off with uh, Daniela, uh, one of the founders from Yopi, Daniela Perry. Uh, and then we're going to move on to Santiago Navarro, also a, um, a founder uh, of a company called Gasson Wines. And they represent the kind of the fresh faces of this um, new uh, sales channel. So they're, they're the kind of entrepreneurial spirit. Uh, and then Nick Dorman is going to be talking about DTC from a kind of brand point of view. So he's one of the managing directors of, uh, of Echo Brand Design. Uh, I'll be doing a short presentation talking about the consumer point of view and uh, how to think about them in this process because there's going to be lots of, I'm sure, pointers and tips about how brands can kind of um, meet the demand space in, in, this, uh, in this model, but uh, we have to remember the consumer point of view as well. Uh, and then I'll be handing over the um, microphone uh, to Janice uh, Thomas from Birchbox. Uh, she's the marketing director and she's going to be representing the success story of DTC. Uh, so I think that's kind of all of the, um, the business stuff. We've got some live tweeting happening, so and TVP Spark, so to get on social media and spread the good word. 
And um, Q&A, if you can just hold on to any questions that you have until the end of the session. I'm sure you've all got notebooks. There are some um, post-it notes kicking about, just so that we can uh, keep track of time. And also we invite our um, YouTube live streaming uh, attendees to also um, post some questions, and we will address those at the end of the session. So I'm going to hand over to Daniela. Uh, thank you so much, and thank you for having me. It's a big uh, opportunity for a small company and an uh, idea for Yopi. Uh, my name is Daniela. I'm originally from Sweden, Stockholm. I live in London since three years ago. And here is our story. I've got a question for you. What is natural to you? To us? Menstruation is natural, maybe a little bit uncomfortable at times, but expected and should therefore be accepted. But strangely enough, menstruation is something that even today is misunderstood by many people and is even a source of shame. But why? Why would such a natural, beautiful thing that connects <coughs> us women and girls all over the world be viewed as such? After all, Half of the population gets it on a regular basis, and a woman will spend approximately 3,500 days menstruating during her lifetime. Yet sadly, for over 100 million girls worldwide, menstruation is perceived as anything but natural, not only affecting their lives dramatically, but their families and nations too. The lack of accessibility to proper menstrual products causes these girls to miss significant amounts of school, which seriously compromises their education and prevents them from reaching their potential in society. But what if you could change that? We already know that women and girls have the potential to change the world. Together, we can change it. Join your happy period, and together, we can make sure girls around the world won't be held back by something as natural and normal as menstruation. We won't only be making your period a little happier, but you'll also help us make sure communities all over the world start seeing menstruation for what it really is. A beautiful, natural thing. So let's talk about menstruation, obviously. <laughs> uh, menstruation is one of the most common and unique female experiences. It's giving us the opportunity to become fertile, becoming pregnant, and then eventually give birth. But unfortunately, the reality is that menstruation today is a global pro problem, with <coughs> millions of girls and women struggling every month with uh, regular menstrual, uh, sorry, <laughs> uh, to manage their monthly periods on a regular basis. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Not because of the pain or the mood swings or the crazy cravings for food or, you know, I'm bleeding too much, I'm bleeding too less, or irregular periods. It's because they have to rely on very crude improvised materials, such as toilet papers, newspapers, banana fibers, scraps of old clothing, on old mattresses, whatever they can find to use. So this is hardly what we should or would consider a solution when the average woman will spend approximately 10 years menstruating over a lifetime. So in fall of 2015, me and my co-founder Nova Hoffman thought the, mis the market was missing a simple and healthy organic option within feminine care. Uh, we were fed up with the offering because no one size fits all, no one diet fits all, uh, and the packs in the stores do not fit my period. So we developed a pro product that we were missing. So Yopi, that is short for your happy period, uh, is a box with tampons made of 100% certified organic cotton, free from synthetic materials, chemicals, a tampon box perfectly tailored after a woman's own period. So how does Yopi work? Uh, so Yopi is a subscription service where the customer, the woman, customizes her own box. She has an assortment of 18 tampons where she can drag and drop and choose the sizes she needs. So you can choose between mini, super, and regular. 
our boxes are letterbox friendly, of course. So pri prior, five days prior to a period, the box will pop in through her mailbox. She, does, she doesn't have to be stressed about it to get it delivered. But the most and probably the most important thing is that our tampons empower women too. For every tampon, for every tampon box that we sell, we include a great social impact. We have invested a lot of time finding the right NGOs and projects that works towards finding and helping women and girls who struggle with the monthly periods. Because we want girls to stay in school, uh, there are millions of girls uh, that are demanding to the right education today so they won't be held back and so they can achieve great success in the society. For example, girls in Kenya may lose collectively 500,000 school days each year because they're not being able to manage their periods. 95% of the girls in Ghana will, is reported to missing school due to menstruation. The Independent reported in March this year that low-income families in the UK are skipping school during periods because they can't afford proper sanitary protection. So this power of nature, menstruation, should that make, make makes us girls miss school? No, we want to stop that and we want to change that. So therefore, for every month you use our tampons, we will donate pads and education in reproductive health to a girl in need. Because choosing Yopi doesn't mean only loving and caring for yourself and the planet, it also making your period matter. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Daniela. Uh, and now I'd like to invite Santiago to the stage. Thank you. Hi, I'm Santiago from Garçon Wines. Um, we're producing these wine bottles you see on the table, um, but I'll come back to them in a second. So I'm basically going to take you through a bit to a journey um, which explains how we can help with wine D2C. And we're a wine subscription club primarily, but we're an innovative packaging format that can be used for D2C. And it's an area that we've been exploring with some big wine brands. Um, so basically, the, the traditional model in wine, going from grape to glass, is, uh, is grape to glass. Is you have a farmer like this gentleman here, who grows the grapes, he sells them on to a winery. A winemaker makes the wine. Um, winemakers and farmers not don't tend to love sales and marketing, so they engage a local cooperative or a negociant <coughs> or someone who comes in and helps the winery sell the wines. Uh, the wines hopefully are purchased by a importer in the destination country who then does some local marketing and organizes these sort of tastings. They seem like a great job to have but uh, they're very tough actually <laughs> when you have to go and taste uh, hundreds of wines a day and remember what they're like and actually um, be, uh, be registering then it's tough. Um, and then finally those people who are buying at the, um, excuse me it's really fuzzy I, I notice uh, quality is not that great. Um, but uh, they sell on to the, the retail trade, um, and obviously that's uh, people like you and I who are buying wines to consume at home. Now what that means is that actually, because there's so many people and it's such a complex supply chain, that you see that the money actually that's left in wine is pretty small. So if you're buying wine at five pounds, you've got around 37 pence worth of juice in the bottle. Um, this is, by the way, a uh, study done by Bebendum, just so I'm clear who I'm uh, nicking this off at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and yeah, so basically you can see that actually as you get up to 20 pounds, you've got about seven pounds worth of juice. Um, and that's because actually it's a complex supply chain and there's also a lot of excise duty and fat in this lovely product. Um, so basically this is a terribly fuzzy infographic which um, shows um, how complex um, supply chain is. And obviously that's a problem when you're talking about D2C because it's anything but. Um, so I hope you'll all agree that um, basically um, the existing traditional model of wine, and actually wine is a very traditional product, is quite complex. And that's because actually um, the origins of wine is based around an, uh, a space where people produce wine locally, they sold it in their local communities, and then comes a country like the UK or the US where a lot of wine is consumed but not a lot is grown there. And so you have this complexity of supply chain. So what next? How do we take wine into, into the future? How do we take wine into 21st century? Um, and D2C is one of those 21st century moves. 
So there is innovation happening, and, and Naked Wines are probably best recognized for that innovation in the UK. And this is Rowan Gormley, who's been um, probably as successful as you can be in the UK wine industry, selling his business for £70 million pounds to Majestic Wines. And he looks quite happy, understandably. Um, now, basically, um, it's our view that um, innovation for D2C must come not in the business model format as with <coughs> Naked Wines. They have sort of a community working in that form, but actually in packaging. And um, I use this to display what is probably, in our view, the single best bit of innovation that's happened in wine since it was um, created, and since it was started, which is the screw cap, which actually allows you to keep wine in a perfect condition from grape to glass. So you can produce wine, you can leave the winery, and you can be guaranteed that if it's drunk in about two years, it will come out of the bottle exactly in the way you put it in, which is key with some uh, whites, for example. So, but this is what we're doing. So, because um, the focus for us is innovation and packaging, we've come up with um, this wine bottle, which is um, the world's first wine bottle, which is thin enough, light enough, and robust enough to go out in the post and to be delivered by this uh, lovely post, uh, men or post lady, um, that uh, would be delivering your post. And the key thing is that it's delivered hassle-free. So, you're, you're out at an event like this or in the office, most of us, unfortunately, are. And um, you see it coming into your house whilst you're away. Um, and key for us is that it looks good on a dinner table. Um, because uh, wine is a very traditional product. There's a lot of heritage. There's a lot of excitement about putting a wine bottle on the table. And whilst you could probably deliver many formats to the post, um, for us, it was critical that it looked beautiful on a dinner table. So what does this mean? And who are these um, lovely people in the slide? They're actually a bunch of entrepreneurial winemakers, and there's many of them. The US is probably primary for this. Um, they're winemakers who are looking to go direct to consumers. They actually employ marketeers and other people within the vineyards, within the wineries, and they're looking at ways in which they can go direct, cut out the supply chain, and actually give more value to consumers and to themselves. Um, Jackie Spear and Tom Carper, are two senators in the US who are trying to overturn prohibition related laws that forbid the US Postal Service for, from selling, sending alcohol. And that's obviously fundamental because if you want to try and deliver in a cost effective way, you need to use the mail service or at least you need to use the final miles, so downstream access. So these are two great people who are um, pretty unique, in fact, because uh, senators don't tend to be seen with uh, wine bottles, pretty stiff people. <laughs> so um, so what, what, what's this about? Basically, Garçon Wines is just a other attempt, but for us, it's, we hope to be a very big part of D2C. We've been very fortunate in as much that since coming up with this innovation, we've been contacted by some of the largest wine producers in the world to ask us if we can license them their, uh, our bottles to supply the wine um, in that format, and we hope to be a big part of it. So, uh, yeah, check us out at Garçon.club. And <laughs> thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, well, I'm going to take a slightly different angle here because I'm not an entrepreneur. Um, I, I work for entrepreneurs and I also work for uh, big corporations who are trying to behave like entrepreneurs like these guys here. Um, and I think um, DTC is a very exciting new space for a lot of people to be playing in. I think there's a lot of companies that very naturally move towards it like these guys here. It feels like an you said it's um, it allows you to go direct to your consumer it allows you to avoid having to go through retailers and so on um, and what I'm going to address is some of the issues that are going to face bigger corporations if you're going to go through this different path um, as I say we're we're a brand agency and an innovation agency and we're we're working with companies who are really trying to help help them navigate through this process so I've got a few things to to sort of point out here I think the first thing is um, that I'm going to kind of reinforce through the whole presentation is that for us, uh, direct-to-consumer is a continuous exchange. And if it's not, it's e-commerce. And they're very different things. Um, and I think we want to, the point I want to make here is that, you know, if you want an e-commerce um, operation, go and do that. If you want a direct-to-consumer operation, that's a different thing, and you need to think about what that is. Um, clearly, we're seeing this sort of paradigm shift in the way that consumers are now engaging with brands and with services and with products. Um, you know, things like 
Spotify has changed the way we think about music. We're still consuming music, but Spotify is changing the way we do it. You know, we're still you know, going to stay in different um, cities, but um, Airbnb are changing the way we do that. We're not necessarily going to hotels, we're going to people's places. So we're seeing this shift in, in not in behavior in the sense that we're still doing the same things, but just doing it in a different way. And the digital world is helping us do that. And so, and that's the same thing with direct to consumer. It's the digital domain that's helping us think differently about these things. And we've heard some really lovely stories here about the, how entrepreneurs are starting to take advantage of that and do that very quickly and easily in a way compared with having to go through a Tesco to this world. Um, and we're seeing some very interesting things here. Now, clearly what, you know, the big corporations are looking at these and going, oh my God, we need to do this as well. And, and um, you know, they're snapping up companies left, right and centre. Um, and that's interesting. But what we've got to be careful of is some of these companies here are doing that so they can get snapped up. Um, and where does their story go beyond that initial sale? You know, where's the longevity in these services? If you take Dollar Shave here, um, I, it's a fantastic idea. It's, it's, it's set up as a real example out there of something that's great. Um, but how protectable is it? Clearly not, because Gillette can come out with almost an identical service immediately. Yes, it's direct to consumer, but is it protectable? So I think when we're looking at direct to consumer, we've got to think about how things work on in, in the future. And I think what I'm really excited about is the opportunities of sustainability through direct to consumer, <coughs> to reducing the carbon footprint quite significantly by not carting water around, which a lot of products have to do. I'm not sure concentrated wine will kind of hit off too quickly. But, but uh, there are lots of opportunities to reduce volumes down through transportation systems. And I think Replenish and Splosh and other companies out there are doing it. But they, they've got to be thinking, and this is going to talk a bit about, what is the product in the home? You know, because this looks to me like something that was designed for the supermarket, not for the home. Um, and so we've got a paradigm shift in the way we think about design as well. So what are the drivers? Um, well, there are quite a few. Uh, mass personalization, we're already hearing about that. Um, lots of entrepreneurs out there. Big data, we can actually use data here to make a better service. DTC is a fantastic opportunity to do that. Sustainability, I've talked about. Consumers wanting to be in control. DTC allows consumers to say what they want rather than being told what to have. Um, and behavioral changes, as in the digital age, has changed the way we think about things. All very exciting, but this is the sort of stuff that I'm hearing. Um, I'm hearing people going, um, I'm just, actually, I'm on DTC, I basically, can you put a retail site on my website? Is that DTC? Don't think so. Um, I want to sort of accessorize my ex existing range and have gifting. Uh, I can do that through DTC. Is that a DTC service? I'm not, not really sure. Um, I just see it as another channel. I'm going to take all the products I currently have that I'm putting through my supermarkets or through e-commerce, I'm going to put them through a DTC channel. Is that right? I don't think so. I think all of these have a problem in that they're not actually having, they don't have this continuous exchange. I think DTC is about surprising and delighting people on a continuous basis. It's not one product that's sold over and over again. It's actually an engagement with lots of different things. You can have broader reach. You can talk to them about more than one thing. Um, as you as you're explained with you know with actually helping girls around the world that's that's adding things in there it can give you high revenue you can premiumize everyone in the western world wants to premiumize their products DTC allows you to do that it allows you to retain your customers through, um, through through subscriptions and also through continuous conversations and the social responsibility thing through sustainability so what I've got here is um, just a few things that uh, that we think are important and you should think about when you're actually embarking on a, um, a DTC program. The first thing is build a vision and a roadmap to get there. Don't just think about, oh, I'm going to launch, bang, I'm going to put something out there. Because actually, if you're going to do this is a whole new world that's not going to end in two years' time. It's going to continue on forever. So where are you going to go with this? You know, your first step is only the first step and it needs to be taking you somewhere. Um, it's not in isolation. If you are a big corporation, you're going to have a retail um, offer. You're going to have a, 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 an e-commerce offer. How does DTC <coughs> relate to that? There are actually opportunities here to reflect on your brand in your, your retail environment, to actually premise, to actually have more conversations going. So they might be buying something through DTC and they go in the store, buy other things in store, which is more appropriate channel. Um, 
And this is close to our heart, our heart because you do a lot, a lot of packaging design. Um, but design the packaging for experience, not the shelf. The, the reason that we're talking to the big picture here is that we, at the same time, we were going, we, we, you know, we were, just to give you an example, we were designing um, an aerosol can for, for um, a, a deodorant, which is, you know, yay big and about this wide. And I saw it one day on a, a, a Tesco's web, uh, a, a website for sales on a square pixel about this big, uh, in a little, you know, for e-commerce, and, and it was a little line. And I was thinking, Christ, we spent loads and loads of time designing that to work on shelf, and now it's been plopped on that little sort of mess of pe uh, pixels, and it just didn't work. Um, so actually, we need to, and thinking about that in DTC, is if we just design things to work as if they would in a supermarket, we're not really taking advantage of the fact that these things are going to live in people's homes or in their offices or on the go. We should be designing them for the consumer experience, not for a sales job in a supermarket. Um, it's, and, and we need to think about the supply chain in that, in that line as well. And I think it's amazing to see these kind of flat bottles and going through, but where does it go then? You know, how does it work even better on the dining room table um, from that point onwards? And the reason I put this up here is this is a horse's carriage. They've lost the horse, right? Which is why they were up here, so they could see over the top of it and they don't get... And they're still up there, you know? And that's actually, when you think how silly that looks now, but that was incredibly sensible at the time. And that's actually how a lot of DCC packaging looks to me at the moment, um, a, a bit like that. Um, the whole th entrepreneurial thing here, it, which really is important to take hold of, is this idea of prototyping, testing, evolving, and, and rolling these things on quickly. You don't have to launch this in several countries at once and test it to death before you go out there. You can test it as you go. You can try things out. It's like um, Sitsmith, I don't know whether you're familiar with that brand, but they, they've got a club where they, they send you out different flavoured uh, gins um, on a sort of regular basis. So, you, so their customers can try them out and tell them which ones they like, and then they can launch them. You know, so they're, they're just trying, you know, you have that opportunity to try things out, which the customer is liking. So again, you've got this continuous exchange. Um, Brands that have been designed to work in supermarkets over the last 50 odd years now have the freedom to, be, to mean more. Um, if you start having a, a service offering, if you start having an exchange, you can start actually being more as a brand. So what, what do you want to be? The, you know, the world's now open to you to be new things. So actually what you often have to do is look back at your core brand values, your brand purpose, and say, is this relevant for this new world? And it probably isn't all there yet. It probably needs stuff adding to it. And very importantly, be sustainable. Um, I've been work I'm fortunate enough to work on some very major projects within big corporations. And looking at the maths involved in, in some of the DCC projects, and looking at actually how you can go to concentrates, how you can reduce packaging enormously, how you can reduce volumes. It's in order to reach some of the targets these companies set themselves, DTC is one of the only ways they can do it because you can actually you can do things there that you can't do through the normal supply chain. So finally, this is, a, this is not just the latest fad. This is going to go on forever. Uh, it's going to get better and better and better. So I think the important thing is here is this is the start of actually building a journey with your consumer to build loyalty, to, build, to get them involved, to get them, they will be willing to give you information if you give them stuff back that is more designed for their specific needs, ultimately customization. And that can go on forever and ever, and it's a very exciting world to be in. So, um, yeah, I think that's, that's the end of it. Um, so yes, so as I said um, before, I'm going to be championing uh, things from the consumer point of view. So we've been um, lucky enough to be part of a number of different DTC um, projects here and we really do believe um, that it's the dawn of a new partnership um, as Nick alluded to you know this is uh, a new era we're moving into and partnership really is I guess the catchphrase um, for us here so um, some of, just to give you a bit of a taste of the kind of projects we've been doing we have been lucky enough to do projects both here and abroad um, including China um, focusing on direct to consumer and that's including doing an audit of existing direct-to-consumer brands, so just getting a taste of who's best in class, 
um, some of the pros and cons of the existing services um, and the products that they offer. Um, and as well, we've been uh, doing projects where we are taking existing brands that are sold um, through traditional channels and identifying if there's an opportunity for them to go direct to consumer, and if so, what that looks like, uh, or if not, what do they need to put in place to make that a reality. Right through to, we don't have a brand, we've kind of got a product, we think we want to sell DTC, how do we sew that all together, what is that going to look like? What's really fascinating for us, um, being kind of the you know, insight gatherers, is that irrespective of the kind of DTC project we've been doing, the needs of the consumer in terms of the actual service itself are really consistent. Um, so that's what I'm going to be talking about today. Um, some of the needs of the service itself. So kind of ignoring what the product offer looks like. But what does um, what does the consumer need to feel um, to buy into this? Because um, it is quite a big ask, really. And um, using lovely Roy Lichtenstein and uh, our consumer Linda to bring the story to life. Um, because Linda represents the needs of a lot of the consumers that we've talked to. Um, and even in China, um, a market where they're quite reticent to DTC. It, there's a lot of kind of trust issues buying things uh, online, but that, uh, that's changing. And we're lucky here in the, in the UK that we have a kind of like flourishing market um, to explore this, this new world. So, Linda, she's a savvy, young, um, digital <coughs> loving woman. Um, she uses you know, digital for everything. She's uh, using e-commerce as her default because she likes you know, the service of digital as much as the product offer it itself. Um, the ease of checking out, um, you know, getting deliveries when she wants to. Um, it makes her feel savvy and modern. And she's really um, vocal about the kind of services that she uses. And she'll talk to her friends about uh, both uh, you know, delightful uh, e-commerce experiences, but also um, things that she hates, so you know, apps that don't work and things like that. Uh, one day, a friend of Linda's told her about a new guy in town, uh, DTC. And he did things a little bit differently. He wasn't just uh, the usual kind of guy that uh, Linda would um, see. And so Linda decided that she would check him out. And so she went online and started to look through his profile. And sure enough, he seemed pretty modern and pretty different. And there was a lot of things about DTC that uh, Linda thought, actually, this is something I could be interested in. Um, he saved her money. Um, which is always great, uh, saves her time because he was organizing her life for her, doing things automatically, because he was supplying her with what she needed at exactly the right time. It meant uh, no brain work. It was just like not even having to think. And also cupboard space, uh, you know, at, at, at a premium. Now she didn't have to worry about having too much or too little. Everything was just going to be arriving at exactly the right time. And he said that he would offer her exclusive choices, so this seemed you know, pretty fabulous, uh, and make her feel like the smart, savvy woman that she is. So Linda thought, yeah, she was DTC, guys. You know, he's not bad at all. She was quite taken by the idea of committing to him. And she could imagine how he'd show up on time with exactly what he said he'd bring, uh, the right, right amount. Um, it, would, it would be like clockwork. Uh, and he would make her feel like the only one. So she felt a bit of a rush of excitement at, uh, you know, at committing to DTC. But actually on closer inspection, she thought, hang on a sec, I think I might be sort of out of control with this. It's a bit of a fast mover. I actually don't have any personal experience with DTC, thought Linda. He wants to take my money every single month automatically without me knowing about it. And actually it's quite hard to keep track of uh, expenses. Um, what if she wanted a break? You know, how flexible was he? You know, would he be able to adapt? You know, if she wanted to go on holiday, would he just kind of keep coming around to her house? Um, was he reliable? Uh, and also he wanted a lot of her private details, more than she was normally willing to hand over when she was doing her usual e-commerce uh, transactions. And she also wondered to herself, what if he got a bit boring? You know, just showing up time and time again. Same old thing. She had a nagging voice in her head and she couldn't help but worrying that he wasn't making the same commitment to her as she would be to him. And ultimately she just felt like she was losing a bit of control and that she was starting to feel tied in. <coughs> uh, 
great quote from one of our Chinese consumers. The biggest thing for Linda is that she felt like she was giving up the search for the next big thing. And there's a real drive about, you know, being a young, modern person, looking out for these kind of new, um, exciting ways of connecting with brands and feeling like you had a, a voice. Um, and for Linda, she simply felt, actually, DTC, he's asking too much. I'm not ready to commit. DTC hadn't listened to Linda's needs. He was disappointed. Uh, he wanted uh, her to commit to him uh, and realize that actually it's more than just offering uh, good value. It's more than just showing up uh, week on week um, with the same old thing. Actually, he needed to be a good partner. And to be a good partner meant six principles. Number one is demonstrating trust. So it's really important for any uh, DTC uh, operator in this space to demonstrate as much dependability and trust as possible because for, it is a big ask for a lot of the lenders out there to be signing up, taking on something that's going to be ongoing. Um, and you know, if you don't have any experience in this, uh, in this space, you need to feel that um, you know, even at the kind of table stakes, a website needs to be clear. Uh, someone that's going to pick up the phone rather than just uh, you know, emailing some kind of complaint. Um, reviews from real people, the number of DTC sites I've looked at where the photos of the, apparently the real people are the same actors that they're using wearing delivery t-shirts and another page on the site. So it needs to be real, it needs to be credible because this is, uh, you know, in the joining up process we need to really instill a sense of trust in Linda. A good partner uh, is also about uh, sharing control and making sure that um, the lenders that you're trying to connect with um, feel like they are part of the, the partnership as well. It's not just all about when the company, when DTC wants to dictate the delivery hours or the size of the box. Linda needs to feel like she's in control of the situation because it is a lot to ask and she's very aware of the fact that uh, companies are getting a lot of private data um, from her her usage attitudes and behaviours. So she wants to feel like actually she's in control, she's going on holiday, she can call the shots, put things on hold. Tied in with that is a sense of flexibility. So this could be things like having different kinds of ranges on your DTC offer. So you could consider a tiered range, allowing Linda to move up and move down different tiers at each time. Uh, about flexibility uh, in terms of um, uh, you know, when she wants to put things on hold or going on holiday. Um, it's, this is not a one-size-fits-all option, which I think is something that um, Daniela talked about. So really tied into this is a sense of personalization. Another aspect of a great partnership is heightening the sense of emotion and really meeting emotional needs. Um, so this is about showing the human face of your DTC. Um, brand. You don't want to just be a kind of faceless automaton. So this could be about having a consistent and recognizable tone of voice, you know, even having lots of photos on the site so that you look more human. Um, messages, personalization uh, in terms of cards that come through as part of the you know, secondary packaging. Some kind of sense that there is a human behind all of this who wants to get to know you and is actually willing to be involved in that partnership. Um, surprise. It's lovely to have something working like clockwork where you don't have to really think about it. It just happens time and time again. It saves brain space. Um, but also it can get a bit boring. So with DTC, we really need to consider variable reward. Um, uh, keep her guessing. Keep Linda inspired about what's going to come next. And quite a lot of the DTC projects we've done have been kind of considered um, kind of gifting um, offers. But you don't want to over-gift or gift too regularly because then that just becomes boring as well. So it's really about keeping her surprised um, and uh, therefore engaged in the process. And something that um, Nick has already alluded to, a sense of delight. And this is really where DTC as a business model um, has kind of the most opportunity. When you create something that feels really seamless um, in terms of being able to use different devices, um, in as much as it's kind of a regular um, conversation with the brand that you're engaged with. 
also in terms of things like you know the physical touch points really need a lot of attention um, because that's the kind of relationship with the brand so you know consider the power of the secondary packaging as it comes through the letterbox and kind of the process of un unwrapping and what joy you can be imparting through something that's really well considered and showing that you know Linda, demonstrating through this conversation that you're having with her, um, that you know her needs, that you know what delights her, you know what she likes, uh, and keeping that kind of interesting. So DTC thought about these six attributes, about being a good partner, and he thought, yes, I can, I can be this. I can be this partner to Linda. But actually, if he really wants to go, um, you know, and, and uh, maximize his potential, it's all about full engagement. <coughs> and we have, at the big picture, developed mm -hmm. the ring of engagement, uh, otherwise known as our 10-step um, direct-to-consumer map. And this is um, uh, a continuous cycle of direct-to-consumer. So as Nick was alluding to before, if we were just talking about e-commerce, we'd stop and maintain, but actually, we're gonna shoot through a diamond and come back round again um, and that's what this is all about. So I don't have time to talk through all of these points right now, but we have a really clear um, model in terms of the jobs to be doing at each stage, uh, the barriers that you want to avoid, uh, but also the gains that you can capitalize on at each stage. And it's, each of these stages is really important. Even things like anticipate, um, which, you know, it doesn't actually feel like a kind of stage in terms of waiting for your nice parcel to come through the post, but that's a really powerful moment for brands to engage with their lenders while she's waiting, make her feel reassured uh, that everything's going to arrive on time and it's going to be exactly what she's ordered. So that's our ring of engagement. Very happy to chat through with any of you afterwards um, about what this looks like. And of course, if we... Um, <laughs> if we put if we put a ring on it, <laughs> then we uh, we're in a happy ending. So thanks very much. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit um, about Birchbox and what we've done so far and kind of what makes us different um, and how we've really grown um, our business and hopefully this is going to spark some really great ideas with all of you. So I'm going to start <coughs> off um, to give you a little bit of history about how our Birch, Birch, Birchbox started and where we came from. So um, Birchbox was the first beauty box, it was also one of the big subscription services um, and we have been often imitated but never bettered in my opinion. Um, so we started off um, that our co-founders Hayley and Katia were at Harvard Business School together and they put together a business plan. So essentially um, this was back in 2010 and they were looking at the market and they observed three key points. So e-commerce was growing massively at that time, but beauty was very much behind the curve. It still represented this much smaller um, proportion of people's spend than other sectors did. Um, sampling in beauty was ineffective, that generally um, if you liked benefit, you were already a benefit customer, you would go to the benefit counter for samples but if you didn't know benefit you probably wouldn't you were so you were essentially brands were sampling their own customer base and not reaching new people and also the ROI of that sampling was very difficult to track um, and the customer was overwhelmed with a category that has literally thousands upon thousands of launches every year so from a consumer perspective, if you're faced with overwhelming choice, how do you find the perfect product for you when time is an issue, money is an issue, that wouldn't it be great if your best friend knew all the latest beauty products, all the best beauty products, what would be best for your particular skin, hair, all of those things. So we developed a model that was essentially a three-stage model for a consumer, that you would get to try a range of products in your box, and they're all personalized. So we ask our customers when they sign up um, about various things from skin tone and skin issues to hair types, 
um, to even what their beauty style is. Are they adventurous? Are they classic? So that we, we tailor their products that they're sampling to them. Um, in addition, we provide them with education that, for example, if you've never bought a primer, you might not know what the value of that sort of product is. So learning is a key part of this for the consumer. So whether that's our editorial content in box, the material we produce online, even video and Facebook Live tutorials, which are great because you have that interactive element and we do have people saying, you know, what would be the right colour for me, you know, what's the right product, you know, gets very specific and personal. Um, and then when the consumer has found something that they love, they have the opportunity to buy, buy the full size product um, from our shop. Um, and this kind of 360 experience works from a brand's perspective as well, that they get to meet new consumers and a very targeted um, and a very open audience who want to try new things. Um, they um, get this education piece, this marketing piece, um, and they also have a channel to distribute their products as well. And we're doing okay. <laughs> we have a million paying customers um, worldwide. We have 100,000 subscribers in the UK. We work with 800 brand partners. Um, in six countries. We launched our first physical store in New York um, and we're about to open in Paris. So that's a little bit about the business model and how it works, but really what's key to our success um, is our consumer um, and how she is different. So understandably, most beauty companies cater to their most profitable customers. And these are very educated customers. So we refer to us, uh, this person internally as the beauty junkie. She spends a lot on beauty. She knows all the latest trends. She reads magazines like Vogue. She has her celebrities and her influencers that she wants to get their look. But this is actually a very small proportion of the population. And a huge amount of marketing spend is spent talking to this woman. So we approach a slightly different audience. We call her Beauty Majority, and she's actually 70% of the population. She is interested in beauty, but it, is not, it does not consume her life. She wants to look like the best version of herself, but she doesn't want to spend three hours doing it. She wants to discover new products, but doesn't necessarily want to spend the time traipsing around the shops or even go into what can be a very intimidating um, environment. If you go into Selfridges, everything is by brand. And if you want to buy a new product, a product that you're not familiar with, that can be very intimidating. So our aim is to create a home for the beauty majority that inspires, um, her, that meets her needs and inspires her wants. And that really works. So after a year with Birchbox, customers increase their prestige beauty spend by 87%. So essentially, we take a woman who probably would never have dreamt of spending £40 on a conditioner. Um, may not use serum or primer or some other, they might not know how to do highlighting and contouring um, or, you know, to have those amazing brows. But through sampling these products, through the education that we provide, she finds the value of doing this and she dramatically increases her spend um, accordingly. And that's not just with us. So 100% of her spend with Birchbox is incremental. So she was spending X before. What she spends with us is incremental. But also she spends 25% more in specialty retailers as well. So that's a little bit about our business model and our consumer. I'm going to talk a little bit, you know, particularly from um, a design perspective, how um, we use Box box partnerships. So we partner with brands to meet new audiences and introduce them to our subscribers in return. So these include brands like Rifle Paper who produce beautiful designs that we partner on box design. Influencers like Millie Macintosh. Media partners like Tatler. And retail partners like Vogue. So 
I hope this has given you some insight into what we do and why it works so well. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Alice. So, um, right, so we've gone through our um, talks um, pretty swiftly, which is fantastic, which means that we've got lots of time for um, questions and answers. Um, so uh, I'm going to take a seat over here and... Um, we can just throw it out to the floor. And also, we've got some, uh, some live streaming questions as well that may have come in. Yeah. Um, so, any questions? Yes? Yes. On Sorkin, you really uh, there's lots going for this great release of rise, such as provenance, their vision, sense of purpose, authenticity, etc. So, the question I'm going to have is how much credibility does a big mainstream, traditionally big, personal care brand has to go into this new world of DTC because most of the stories I have would be DTC brand now going mainstream but little do I know stories of the other way around. Follow up question to that is if it were so, if that is a possibility, how does a big personal care brand differentiate through DTC when consumers would just probably go to Boots, grab that same bottle? that they're so used to doing easily every month during meeting. Yeah, is that, um, I, is that a good question? Because I feel like I've got a great experience in, in, in answering that, which is that, you know, this isn't the kind of definitive answer, but I think um, the, there is a challenge if you're going to take a traditional brand sold through traditional channels and try and turn it into DTC, because uh, unless you're offering your consumer something that they can't get anywhere else, you're kind of... Um, still giving them the opportunity to be by, to fall back on their you know same old um, shopping behavior that they've always done so some potential solutions might be around um, uh, creating some kind of bespoke basket you know so curation um, so rather than just supplying one product you're curating and so in that respect you're not just um, providing the consumer with what they, you know, with your brand, but other things that they might use, you know, in their cleaning um, uh, mm. process, or it's about a format that's different. You know, I think some sense of exclusivity um, is really is really paramount. Otherwise, I, I don't think value is enough. You know, value for money isn't quite enough. Consumers are pretty savvy as well, and they, their sense of control, knowing that they're able to be looking across different retailers for the best price, is actually a personal reward for them as well. So. It's a, so I think it's about finding that value proposition that saves not only money, but time, a sense of curation and personalization. Yeah, do you have anything uh, to well, add? I think the thing is here is that um, if you're going to do it on a big scale, you've got to de develop a supply chain for it. Mm -hmm. And um, you've got to question whether Amazon do it better. Um, so if it, if it really is you're just putting your own product that you currently have through, through a DTC channel and you've got some little bit of a conversation going or some exclusivity it's not going to last is it i mean let's face it and you know because if you just think well if amazon can do it i really shouldn't do it let's let's partner with amazon or one of those other people to go and do that that properly because they will have that expertise you have to play to your expertise and mainstream brands have got expertise they've got you know they've got r d teams behind them they've got huge amounts of knowledge about the consumer it's about bringing all that to the fore and playing to that that to advantage through that particular channel. But it's very unlikely to gonna be the products that you get in boots. Mm. Uh, and if it is, that's really gonna be a, 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 a normal e-commerce channel. I mean, a couple of quick things on what Nick said. Uh, certainly the dash button for um, getting standard products much quicker is, is a model that's very interesting. But on the experience and on the variety, certainly for us with wine, um, mm. there's about a million pr wine producers across the globe. Now, no retailer holds those wines, but actually, if you're offering that direct service, you can go and find those more niche wineries and supply that wine where traditionally they wouldn't go through the existing bricks and mortar or even online model because it's just not worth conducting any marketing for somebody who produces 10,000 liters a year, um, but they're still a viable um, winery. I think the other thing is that convenience regularly comes up. But one thing we found on talking to people about, about um, our wine service is the carefree element. Mm -hmm. So just, I know I drink two bottles a week, and I don't really want to know much other than I'm going to get two bottles a week at some point. 
through the door. So it's not only the convenience factor that, that, that you, you don't have to be in to take delivery, but that you know that it, um, you get it at the frequency which you normally consume it. And I think that's why, for example, blades and other products like that are so um, great, because you could frankly pick up blades quite easily on bulk once every year. But it's just that carefree thing, I know that I'm going to get my blades through the post. Yeah, we found that there's kind of an interesting um, split between uh, the kind of um, proposition that works really well through DTC and they kind of operate at different ends. So one is your just replenishment model, so basic things that you're getting really regularly, you kind of know the amounts that you're using you know, more or less every month. Um, and at the other end of the scale, things that are really exclusive or that are very treaty, um, that seems to work um, uh, as, a kind of, as a proposition. Yeah, because I want to say yeah. it's about also b building a community and mm -hmm. giving the customer that value. And that's why mm -hmm. I think Birchbox is doing yes. really great, that um, they educate their buyers uh, in makeup and we giving them the power to help girls mm -hmm. because that's why we symbolize with I am a yoppy. So it's the community fact. When you go into boots, you don't feel for the brand. Yeah. Uh, uh, another so. another advantage that's on your list of things is trust. Mm -hmm. I mean, mainstream brands are, are trusted. Um, so you, you're, uh, un, unlike an entrepreneur who's got to build that trust over time, you can actually go straight into it with trust there. But you've got to deliver on it um, in that different environment. You, the, the mainstream brands already have that there. Mm -hmm. I guess as a startup brand, though, you can leverage on others' trust, including, for example, reliability on delivery by, you know, Using Royal Mail's brand and other yeah, things absolutely, like that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And, and you're, you know, if there are known suppliers of, you know, vineyards and things like that with history, you're bringing that provenance out and you're connecting all those people, aren't you? Correct. Cool. Hi. Um, this is a question for Janice. Um, I find it really interesting that you guys have opened some physical stores. And I was wondering how you translated the birch box experience into bricks and mortar so it's not just, you know, another Selfridges beauty hall. Yeah, I think particularly um, our New York story is very interesting because we merchandise by product area and not by brand so that you can look at lipsticks or you can look at shampoo um, and all of those things and bringing that experience, which we know our customers love, to a physical store is actually very innovative. And is that something you're going to like keep? That's going to be part of the kind of ongoing um, kind of mix of things that you do to get sort of hands on. I um, think there are, there are reasons people. why we might want to have a flagship mm. retail location, but ultimately, what we do is about a specific experience. There are certain reasons why adding a flagship retail store to that may enable us to give an enhanced experience to our customers um, and that's what that's the reason why we do that yeah. and, and are you selling it as pay as you go or is it pay monthly so do you come into the store see the lipstick see the products and then choose a box which you get monthly or how does that work yes yeah, so you you can build your own box okay. in store and that's an experience we've done for example in the uk with selfridges and a pop-up that you know you get for example, you get five products in the box, so you can go in and there's a whole host of products and you can then pick your personal five products and pay £10 in the box. That you would obviously be the experience that would be curated for you online. And do the final products always get delivered in a convenient way or how does it work? Sorry. So in store, you're actually building your box yourself. Okay. But yes, obviously the online ex experience is it's selected for you though we always have an element of choice every month, whether that's a product or the box design, but the rest of the products in your box are customised according to your beauty profile. Great. Any other questions? I was just going to ask another question in relation. And do you find that people are going in store and then they are actually always signing up as a result, or then they become online customers? It's much more of an education process than necessarily a being a direct conversion we do convert a proportion of our customers but generally our model is not necessarily about we want you to sign up right now it's like we want you to experience Birchbox and very much that's the approach with our subscription model is with our monthly, monthly option you can cancel at any time and we'd much rather that people came in um, and had what they need and felt free to leave and come back and again at a later date. I'm interested in, um, all of you will have started at some point uh, with these incredibly customised boxes that you 
you scale magnificently, how do you keep that um, customization at huge scale? Um, and how did you start it, actually? I'm probably more interested in the beginning parts of that. Uh, Should we start with me, the smallest? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Um, we actually started packing ourselves uh, to understand and how we, the workflow and writing all the notes ourselves and doing welcome cards to each customer. <coughs> and that, what we realized is that our box now <coughs> is not 100% perfect. So we need to change that. Um, uh, I'll not tell you to what, but it's going to be <laughs> even better. Uh, but yeah, so I think it's really important to be involved in the process. Uh, and for us, it's been a matter of buying quantities uh, and playing with the margins. Uh, and obviously, you can have better margins, you better quantities, you bigger quantities you're buying. So we have a dream, dream vision of our product and our margins. But obviously, we can't be there today. Uh, yeah. So I'm not going to answer the question because we've not shipped anything yet. We're in the mm -hmm. process of starting to ship. So. Um, I, 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 so maybe we should change. I'm a, I'm a, fraud, I'm a fraud, basically. <laughs> and, and just on um, your first kind of how you actually did that, were you literally going to the post office and sending that every day? That, Me? Yeah. 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 So, you're yeah, so uh, our um, offering is very customized. So uh, the woman will tell us her cycle, the dates, when her period is due, if she knows her period. Not all women do that. And then we would choose a date for her conveniently. And then approximately a week before a period, the, letter, the box will go through her mailbox. So yes, it's us going to the Royal Mail in the UK and the Postno in Sverige uh, and delivering it. True startup. Yeah, yeah. And, and back to the trust again. Yeah, so then our trust is with the Royal Mail and Postno. Um, so for example, in Sweden, uh, the Royal Mail uh, is really bad. So we have a lot of bad experience with um, people not getting their boxes delivered and so then we have to gain our trust there and explaining why we're using not tracked parcels and of course we'll give you a free box for free next month and then we have to be very personal with the customers on that because you don't mess with periods. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'll like quickly add actually we don't have that luxury so that's why we're collecting enough people so that when we launch we can launch with around several thousand, some between five and ten thousand because you buy wine in bulk and it, they come in massive bladders of around five, ten thousand, twenty five thousand liters. And I need enough customers to be able to fill that weekly because our bottle has about a shelf life of six months and people need to drink it within that six months. So what have you said to your customers you're signing up? Are you saying you've got to reach a certain number or you've given them a date? Or uh, We are, yes. Yeah. Um, but that date does sometimes shift. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, the uh, postal <coughs> delivery service is one of the biggest limitations that we found um, operating a DTC subscription model in China, just because the, there was just no trust in terms of um, the you know the, the delivery service. So um, seems like kind of like an, something that you only really need to consider at the end of your you know business model in terms of developing it, but actually kind of needs to be considered right at the start. But Royal Mail are one of the best delivery services well, in the exactly, world. Exactly, which is, I guess, one of the reasons why in the UK it's done really well. Yeah, they are really, we have no... <laughs> <laughs> I guess they regularly say they're proud to be better than Deutsche Post, which is, um, if you're better than the Germans, then you must be doing something good. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it, it, it was a bigger, I mean, I think uh, the number is on there, I think it started with a thousand boxes, yeah. so it started with a reasonable um, reasonable volume. But yeah, so what we do now, it's actually difficult for some brands to sample a hundred thousand mm -hmm. products in one go. So particularly what we'll do, for example, is we'll say, right, this month we're going to do hair care, and we, we've got... <coughs> 30,000 of this particular sample, which is suited to this <coughs> type of hair, so therefore we'll need to source um, some different products that complement other types of hair and, and build those in terms of what our product offering is for a particular month. And then there's a very complex algorithm that looks at what's the best fit for the products that we have and the subscribers that we have, and, and therefore which box should go to which person. And then you own the supply chain backwards from that, do you? Or is, is that something that you so all of our brands, because every we don't produce any own brand products, so no. brands deliver into our warehouse who then package that up and then send it out to the consumer. Okay. 
And I guess you have a kind of physical, quite a real physical limitation in terms of actually how the box gets put together because I guess certain products are too kind of too big to share in a box or I guess... Yeah, sometimes we, we do have a monthly meeting where we go through all the products we have mm. in the box and we do have things like actually those three products can't all go in the same box yeah. because otherwise they're not going to, mm. they're not going to physically... Fit. Yeah, but uh, yeah, we do have some interesting logistical <laughs> issues like that sometimes. Say, no, and also um, back to um, how we started. It's just about like doing it and trying because your first customers will be your best ambassadors and the best one evaluating you and telling you this will not work. This is not nice. Uh, I mean, Birchbox started like that as well, um, and that's why Birchbox your customer journey is so good because you've been running it for a while so just start doing it like you can buy so nice stuff in the store and you know that will not be your profit margin today but eventually you will have better ones I think, I think it's quite interesting I mean it's always a challenge of the project we're working on it's how you get the product to you mm. and the one we're talking about through the letters <coughs> in your home but I think things are going to really accelerate it's not just DTC it's e-commerce as well it's like I mean we hear about drones and all that sort of thing but m the more practical thing is like corner stores they're reinventing themselves. You know, they used to just sell a load of stuff which was slightly out of date because they couldn't turn the stock over. And now, actually, they can their their point their contact points, which are very convenient. They're on your way home, and you can just pick pick things up. So you can start picking things up which are slightly larger than your letterbox. Um, still got to carry it, but it's you know. And I think that's only going to accelerate. New businesses are going to start popping up all over the place that are going to help that delivery mechanism ha work for people. And of course, that means it. That means, I mean, it's interesting. You've got the big supermarkets as well, go, you know, going local and trying to sell all the stuff that they're selling in the big supermarket down in the small place. It doesn't really work because actually you wanted the stuff you got in the big store. So actually, all those things are going to be reinvented because actually local points are going to be able to deliver anything you want. Mm. Essentially, you can, you know, absolutely customize. So that's that. I mean, I'm talking UK here, but I think these things just accelerate. I mean, you know, once someone sees a model working somewhere it'll happen somewhere else. So I think we're going to see a lot of change. I guess it's companies like Amazon that launch the Amazon lockers mm -hmm. and yeah. where you can do that. And I guess with food, a lot of us now are, are buying food on impulse through Uber Eats and others and, and other brands can use them. Certainly we're looking at um, some opportunities for impulse yeah. um, purchases of wine through your letterbox. So. I just have a question then. So yeah. this next point on sort of the potential future ubiquity of D to C, and just sticking with the theme of your presentation, mm. just how many relationships can someone hold down, right? Yeah. And because my neighbour's only going to sign for so many parcels right when I'm out. Yeah. So, any views from the customer side on kind of how that how it fits? I in? think it's still too fresh for them to kind of think, consider what what the potential endpoint is, or what the tipping point is. But I think the real question is how can brands continually um, inspire and delight their consumer because. It, um, and I think, you know, to, to Nick, to your point earlier, if you can, as a brand, you know, continually inspire by putting new products in, keeping things interesting, then there's kind of no end point, really. It's going to take, probably going to take, um, you know, it's a tough ask for someone to kind of slot in to uh, a relationship that's working really well, rather than kind of keep the relationship that's already going, you know, alive and well. Um, so... It's, I think, so I think there are some people who should go, we're not going to do this. You know, let's be sensible yeah. about this. But they have a danger as well. I mean, if you take things which might be commodity, like um, laundry powder, and you think, well, that's not really for us, is it? Mm -hmm. But actually, if you look at the future of laundry, and you go, well, actually, there are now machines that you can put product in, load it in. I think you're going to make them. So, so actually, you think, well, okay. So, who who owns laundry now? Is it the machines? Who's supplying the product? And they go, well, actually, could it be Amazon? Because actually, they could sell you the machine. And they could sell you the, the liquids and the powders and the products you put in the machine. They could give you the knowledge and they could own it. So actually you're going to get different people actually owning these different categories because it's going to be who is ever having the relationship and the contact with that, that particular consumer. Uh, it's, it's, a lot's going to change over the next few years, I think. It's so interesting, though. Your point um, assumed that things couldn't be delivered when people were out. And I think there's... That's a fundamental point. If I think your neighbour keeps on taking delivery for you, you will feel bad, and I'll you be will be very worried about them receiving my wife. Correct. <laughs> correct, correct. But I certainly think, in answer to specifically your question, I mean, I'm sure we hope they're all polygamous rather than monogamous. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, were there questions from the live yeah, stream? Yeah, we've got some. Uh, actually, you've answered a couple of questions, which is great from the live stream. Um, someone called Joe. Hello, Joe. Um, what does the future road mapping exercise look like for DTC? This is quite a big question. So, how do you use that continuous exchange to adapt? And build that vision of, of where you're going. So this might be a good question for um, Janice. Just thinking about you've had seven years, haven't you, of um, trying to adapt? Have you got any good examples you can share about you know, how you put your things into practice and learning? I think it's a continuous learning experience. I yeah. mean, for example, in the UK, we grew 100% last year. So you know, we're we're not. You know, this is not something that's necessarily plateauing. And for us, it's learning how to better identify our target audience. Um, we still have a huge role um, to play in terms of educating people, but still there's a, you know, there is a huge market for people who don't even aware that the category even exists. So for us, it is actually about how do you evolve? And I alluded to earlier, the fact that you know, we're working with brands who can't send out 100,000 samples and how do you then make sure that those brands are reaching the perfect person and you know, how do you evolve? Um, how do you evolve the box and the experience um, and try to um, make sure that you're enhancing that value for the, in the relationship for the consumer that they feel like they are getting back um, at least as much as they're putting in. Yeah, and you mentioned um, your relationship with your bloggers and vloggers and things like that. How crucial has that been for the, for the growth of the brand? Yeah, I mean, I think um, for us, we've been, um, you know, we've partnered with people, but also we've been very lucky to have a lot of people who've been real cheerleaders mm -hmm. for the experience. Um, and certainly in terms of our marketing strategy, that word of mouth um, and organic sharing is worth a huge amount. Um, and it gives that credibility and trust um, in a way that um, nothing else really can. Yeah. yeah, it's really interesting shift in marketing, isn't it? That it, that, that it actually is in the hands of the people now. Yeah. I think that was the, the main question from. Did anyone else have any thoughts on the, the kind of future in terms of. Well, the great thing is you can learn as you go. Yeah. I mean, you, you, you can hear back from your customers on a continuous way. That's the big data thing, isn't it? That if they're willing to give you information because they're getting improved services. You're going to get more information and you can respond to it. Yeah. So that's, I think, it's incredibly yeah, it's exciting. Yeah, yeah, it's incredibly exciting. And don't be afraid for that feedback. Like, don't mm. think that the company is over and, like, oh, the review was bad and, like, I, uh, we lost 10 customers. Like, that's what's going to make you better. As you yeah. say, it's how you respond to Yeah, that. that's, that's how important. you respond and how you and react. How you respond, so. Yeah. 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 And I made the point about reviews before, but actually this was a really important point for a lot of our consumers, particularly those who weren't um, already buying into subscription, is reading the reviews, because that is the kind of human part of the, you know, the app or the website that they're about to join in, you know, the word of the real people, that's kind of the gospel. And um, there's almost a bit of um, reluctance to, to, to believe a brand that was only posting positive reviews. You know, if it was all five stars, they're kind of like, really? You know, who are these people? They're, they're just kind of actors. It's, it's not real so you know having showing a kind of realness and showing that um, you're kind of growing but you're willing to kind of learn from mistakes as a brand I think is that's a hugely powerful voice to have that you don't have in the traditional um, channel so you know why not capitalize on that kind of human dialogue uh, the question on that is that I mean if you go on to sort of Airbnb I mean and you look for a place I mean I go through all the reviews very thoroughly and there are always reviews there but if you're buying I don't know some soap um, it are they are those reviews real? You know, going to mm. be real? Are they going to be from people that are just angry and they've you know had a very bad soap experience, <laughs> or, or, or what are, they, it, are they valuable at that point? At that sort of you know, not, at the lower level, those low price items are they actually useful? Yeah, I guess that's a yeah. Do we even need reviews for soap? I mean, well, I'm surprised yeah, that there are. I mean, if lodging you is probably one of the most emotional purchases we make. So I yeah. guess Airbnb would be a great one. Yeah. Uh, the hotel industry is the same. I'm, um, I'm surprised I have seen reviews of things <laughs> like so. Yeah. On, uh, on the online shopping sites, there are yeah. stars yeah. Yeah. products. So if you choose in between two types of mints, you can look at the and stars, yeah. make your decision. Presentations I've seen um, from retailers talk about the power of reviews, even for you know commoditized um, goods, uh, and that they have real pull power for, for sales. Mm. Um, any other questions? Oh, a few. 
Oh, oh sorry. <laughs> um, it's back to the question of premiumisation actually with wine. Yeah. Given that people shop by bottle shape and label and uh, taste it, what's your point of view on that and how that translates to something? Yes, good question. It took us about a year and a half to develop these bottles because we were insistent on having two bottles that adhere to the two major shapes. So this is the Bordeaux shape. There's a burgundy shape, which will be coming live shortly. And most of still wines are produced in either Bordeaux or burgundy shape. So for us, it was fundamental that when people saw the bottle, they would have that recollection to the existing shapes um, rather than just any shape. So we went through shapes that looked like cricket bats and, and other things, which, um, you know, looked looks strange and um, so um, that point yes we don't really taste wines in a retail environment so the taste element I guess probably we subconsciously get from the label and from certain elements of brands like Appalachians, Chianti, Bordeaux, um, uh, Chablis uh, etc um, but for us it's been fundamental a that the plastic could be glass like that the shape was adhering to the traditional shape um, and that, um, yeah, as I mentioned before in the presentation, that they look great on the dinner table. And that's why it took us so long to create the bottles, um, because we went through so many iterations. And the struggle with a startup when you're doing something in this space, which is owned pretty much by the big SMCG brands, is you really struggle to get any R&D space um, to, uh, to prototype. Which I guess we put more emphasis on the label to differentiate a bunch of bottles that all have the same shape. Uh, yes, correct. Which is what we do in what we do in most supermarkets. I mean, most people, frankly, do shop by label um, and uh, and use price as a benchmark of quality, which is an awful benchmark. Uh, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, the, the label is very important, uh, and for us, um, it's been key in our uh, discussions with wineries is that we can use their own wine labels yeah. on our bottles. So do they have? Do they have to change the label around? Uh, no, actually, the, um, that's oh. an exact uh, um, label size on that bottle. I guess that was and really fits. important. Uh, then. Yes, yeah. correct. Um, yeah, hi. Um, so personalisation was a key theme that came kind of across all of your presentations. Um, and one of the questions that I've got is, do you kind of learn from the customer as well? So is the personalisation like Birch Box, for example, where you've got kind of someone that's you've got four buckets that people sit in? Or do you say if your customer then comes back and buys something that was in that box, do you, do you then learn that or they like these kind of products or they are into more premium products and then you tailor based on kind of algorithm learning of what they come back and buy or review or feedback? We generally go by what people tell us because that's quite important that you know kind of you might be buying full size for example <coughs> something that's for a gift it may not be yeah. it may not be for you so and it's very important for us for the customer to feel like they're in control so that is based on um, that's based on the information that they tell us we use things like for example um, if there is a product you particularly enjoyed in your box we'll follow up with you a few weeks later to say would you like to buy that particular product that you really liked in full size so that's more how we use the data in, in kind of recommending them products they might want, like to buy than necessarily what we would send them to sample in their box is it all based on first questionnaire then? It's a live, it's a live questionnaire. Okay. So yeah, I mean to be fair, generally you know things like your skin tone, your hair type, you know your your taste will not. I'm not saying they would never change, but they they tend to be fairly fixed. Um, that you would have to have quite a significant change to change your beauty profile. You might tweak it depending on what products you were receiving. Mm -hmm. um, that you might particularly choose to give more detail. Um, because of what you were you were receiving, you might want to tweak it. But one of the things um, that we've added this year that we've always had an element of choice, but we've now said we guarantee that every month you can choose either a product in your box or um, your box design, so you feel like you have the element of choice as well as your beauty profile. You actually get to pick. I think that's a really important um, point that you feel like you have the ability to twist because we've found actually that as long as you kind of nod to personalization that's often enough because there's a kind of recognition when you talk to people that actually it's not going to be like individually kind of handcrafted we've talked about um, products where they, they might be kind of personalizing the scent of something and they're like 
well, okay, I don't really actually believe that someone's going to be individually tailoring my own, you know, signature scent, but it's the, the nod to uh, personalization. So um, it's, but, it's just as important. But you look at the car industry, car industry has been personalizing products for since Henry Ford starts, decided it's not going to be black. I mean, you know, you can change the color, you can change the interior, you can do all those mm -hmm. things, but they all run down the same line. They all are very carefully sort of considered how you do that customization. But I think it is possible. Yeah, but the, or as we do it, if the customer don't know what to choose, we will choose for them. And do you see that change in the future? You know, you talk about big data as well, and that we learn more and more about the consumer, that it becomes actually bespoke instead of personalised. I mean, I know when my customers are craving chocolates, for example. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I think that information is valued somehow. But then I think you need to have that in your brand, but like, at, like what do you want to do with that information? And that needs to be inconsistent with your brand and your journey of developing your company. And yeah, I think from our perspective, discovery is really important. Yeah. So just because you've never bought a particular category before doesn't mean that you wouldn't like it if you had the opportunity to <coughs> try it. So for, um, for example, like one of the things that um, is really important to consumers when they sign up is they want to know that the box will contain brands that they've heard of. But actually, once you're a subscriber, the thing that you're most interested in is brands you haven't heard of and brands you haven't experienced. So um, you don't want to end up with the Amazon Harry Potter effect that everyone gets, you know, everything rates the same thing highly, so they all end up the same. Actually, part of the reason that women use our service is it challenges them to try something they wouldn't have otherwise. Uh, so I also think you need very big data for it to be relevant data. And that's the problem sometimes, we all use the buzzword big data. But if you've got, for example, 30 million regular wine drinkers in the UK, you need to have a lot of data in order to make some meaningful decisions to necessarily take someone down a route. I think you should allow them to explore. Likewise, um, I think wine companies that ask people a lot of questions on entry to a club to try to determine what to send them, they end up probably failing them in that journey that Janice was saying, because there's so many lovely wines in the world that we may not think we like. It's the same thing that, for example, a Guinness tastes weird for maybe a lager drinker. But if you join a beer club, you should probably try a Guinness during that experience. If you really, it's a deal breaker, send me another Guinness and I'll quit this club, then you'll probably <laughs> take that into consideration. But it's the same thing with wines. You should allow people to try tannic wines or wines that smell of gasoline or whatever. And they do exist and they're premium wines. So. But that, that's a, a really interesting point, is, is that if you go on e-commerce, e the algorithms are going to take you to the most popular. They're going to take you to what you bought before. It's going to, and, and we hear a lot about the world out there is narrowing choice, actually, because of the algorithms. They're just taking closer and closer. DTT allows you to sort of open it up through the trust thing, is that if you trust the information that you'll get, you know, you're coming in, you can actually say, oh, we'll try this, and it's only a little bit, so if it's really terrible, it won't be that bad. You're not buying this much of it. That that opportunity to explore and experiment is really exciting. I think it's, it's we, we've so. even had feedback from customers to say, "I really didn't like that product. Mm -hmm. I appreciate the opportunity to have sampled it rather than paid full price for it." Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I think Spotify is excellent for the discovery. I think they, they do, their, their algorithm is really mm. uh, successful for me. I just uh, am constantly discovering new um, new music through through that. Yeah. You've got another question over there. Great. Hi. What sort of retention rates do you companies enjoy? I don't have them. <laughs> <laughs> 100%, isn't it? <laughs> Retention, do you want to talk I'd about retention? I'd say we're very happy with our retention. I think, as I alluded to earlier, I would much rather that you felt as a consumer that you could take a break from three months um, and then come back at a later date than at, you know retain 100% of our customers, but then when they leave, they never come back again because we made the experience too difficult. I'd rather that they dipped in and out when they're ready to do so. And I think I'm not revealing too much to say you can't build a subscriber base of a million people if you're you're having to recruit a million pe new people every month so yeah so our customers or user can end whenever they want and what we realized was that 18 tampons was very much enough for a couple of months for some females 
uh, but we can't sell 18 tampons telling them to use less. So therefore we had to implement a frequency of every second month. And that we learned from when a customer signed up <coughs> and we asked, why did you, why weren't you satisfied with the, our product? And she said, I have tampons for three months now. <laughs> and, and then you just give them a uh, discount code and you're welcome back whenever you want and we'll give you 20% off. <laughs> so yeah, we, we want to make it like, as I think everyone was mentioning, a service that's just adding value more than you know, <coughs> in Sweden we say the HBO and Netflix syndrome. Like you sign up and then suddenly they charge you money for it, but they didn't say that they would. Mm -hmm. So it's better to like really gain the customer, the trust, and and want them to stay. I think certainly for those of us who are running subscription businesses, it is fundamental though. So it's, a, it's probably the key commercial question. Do you have lifetime value? If you're looking at this from making money perspective because I guess some of us don't make money on those first few deliveries. And so if you don't have lifetime value, you have um, a loss making business. Cool, hi. Yeah, so a number of you mentioned subscription and stuff. So like, what are your, if I look back at the start of your business, or kind of where you guys are now, what were kind of the, the earliest hurdles to kind of building a subscriber base and kind of how did you guys um, hurdle them? Uh, oh yeah, heard, I think I understand the word right. But um, as you've seen, we love video content. Um, so we started uh, by launching this video uh, on the 28th of May. That is the Inst International Menstrual Hygiene Day. Um, and we did like a pre-sign up. We're launching this amazing product. And then we built a newsletter, like a sign up list. And those, has, those women has been, and some few men, uh, have been our best ambassadors and been sharing our content and then when we launched in the end of September we also launched with a video that has been shared and viewed um, I think a million times. So for you it was awareness? Yeah That's awareness, awareness. word of mouth, people who really believes in your product. I think you need to start on grassroots uh, depending especially with our case when it's that type of product. So with us has just been uh, press mayhem so um, we've been very lucky that from we um, launched the bottles via TV show last uh, November, December, um, and we put out a press release to say we were on the show in January. And since we've just been um, pretty much on every newspaper, most TV stations, um, yeah, newspapers globally, um, radio stations, um, yeah. So we we actually turn down every week um, press mentions or press things because basically there's no one to handle. Um, I don't normally do these, my co-founder does, but he's too busy, so I've been drafted in to do this. <laughs> so uh, yeah, it's, it's a luxury situation. I guess one doesn't know how viral your idea is until you put it out to the media, and then um, yeah, you, you be, you're able to be picky. And because of that, we have thousands and thousands of subscribe, uh, email subscribers who have uh, expressed uh, interest in buying our service. China's biggest hurdle. Yeah, I think even today it's still um, education and still getting people to understand, you know, why they might want this. And you know, I I remember, you know, I I've while well, I've only been in this particular role five months, I've actually been a Birchbox subscriber for five years. And I remember the moment that you know, reading an article about this service and being like, oh wow, that sounds really interesting, and then trying it and falling in love, and you know, go from there. The rest is history. Okay, great. I think we're, um, we uh, uh, have kind of um, had a great uh, experience talking to our um, guests, so a, a round of applause. Um, <laughs> questions um, and thank you also for those who have tuned into our live streaming event so I invite all of you to stay for a while if you can and enjoy some um, DTC beer and wine and food <laughs> so carrying on the theme and uh, hopefully you guys can stick around for a bit and maybe answer some more questions but thanks very much everyone thank, thank you, you. Thank you.